I think we're going to uh, start. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce today's uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Alexander Bost. Um, so Axel's obtained his PhD degree from the University of Würzburg uh, with Martin Heisenberg, uh, during which uh, his PhD training that he um, study of factory learning and it's probably make one of the most important uh, discovery in our factory uh, learning is to demonstrate that um, the mushroom body in the fly uh, seems critical for our factory uh, experience and learning. So after being a, a junior group leader at Tubigans and a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, Axel returned to his native lands uh, to direct the Max Planck Institute uh, of Neurobiology where he is now. So, um, Axel is very well known uh, for his work on the visual motion field, and in particular, um, his work on um, the dendritic computation in the fly lobular pretangential neurons really beautifully demonstrate how this local um, input can be summarized, integrated to encode for global uh, motion information. So I find, I find, look through, you know, Axel's contribution in the field, uh, the most amazed me is really that Exos research is scale free. You know, he's free, freely going through, you know, from very uh, experimental and very theoretical work, you know, ranging from synaptic physiology, you know, uh, network response to nature images, you know, to, to the psychophysics stuff. Um, so in the motion field, uh, Exos is also very well known as the defender of, or I should say the crusader of the right car, uh, most model of a motion detector, and I think that he's going to tell us a great deal about uh, how little fry and most likely how us actually perceive motion. Okay, without further ado, please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bost. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Chihon, for the nice introduction and uh, for inviting me here to this prestigious lecture series and i'm very much looking forward to the lab visits uh, that you have scheduled for tomorrow <clears throat> so um, i was you know intrigued already at a when i was a student how the brain computes information and in particular when i started you know attending cellular neuroscience classes I wanted to learn how that is sort of implemented in the neural wetware. But there, you know, I learned how ions cross membranes through pores, how action potentials are generated, how that leads to transmitter release that then bind to postsynaptic receptors. And that made all sense to me, but it didn't answer my question, so to say. And I, you know, still am driven to make this connection between you know, basic biophysics of nerve cells and these sort of high-level computations that we and other animals are capable of doing. And um, when I came to Würzburg to study uh, uh, biology, you know, I was introduced by Martin Heisenberg to the fly as a model system. Uh, and I thought that, you know, studying motion vision in flies is the perfect example for neural computation in a tractable organism where we can really sort of pin it down to single neurons and circuits and then understand this neural computation of motion detection in an unprecedented detailed level. So, and uh, this is sort of my uh, holy grail that I'm after and we're not quite there as you will see, uh, but uh, we made some progress. So that's what I want to talk about. But before, before going into the details of that, I want to convince you that motion vision is not only sort of a perfect example for <clears throat> neural computation, it's also a very important visual cue. So um, motion vision can be used to detect the uh, presence of objects. If you, for example, look at this little branch here, see whether I can start the movie. If it's stationary, you don't see anything except this branch. Oops, sorry. Um, let me see whether I can do better. Now, let's see what's happening. Watch this. <laughs> 
there's a spider, right? And as long as the spider wasn't moving, you know, you would not detect the presence of the spider on this branch. And it becomes visible by moving, right? But uh, motion can also be used to see what is moving, not just that there is something moving, like in this famous example for biological motion uh, by Johansen. Um, you know, there's just this collection of points here, but when I activate it, you see it's a walking man, right? And uh, that kind of uh, <clears throat> technique is used by the movie industry. You know, it's called motion capture. So they film, you know, an actor with light bulbs on the joints and then they can transfer the trajectories of these light bulbs to any sort of other model and then this model moves like the actor had moved and you can recognize the actor by the kind by the way of uh, the, he moves so the, you know maybe michael jackson's you know skeleton dance stuff you know the, this is how it was made um well in those two examples you know there was something else moving out there um but motion also occurs when we ourselves are moving in the environment. And so I, to demonstrate that, I want to take you on a roller coaster ride here um, and uh, see what that looks like to you. Um, when you, you know, move in this roller coaster, then the whole world moves across your retina. And you can, you know, if you stand close enough, to the screen, or if you're sitting in an IMAX theater, then when you go into a curve, like you feel pressed against the seat, although your vestibular system is silent as can be, right? And when you go over the top, then you feel lifted up in the air, and that is uh, a very vivid impression, and it's an illusion that no one can escape. And in fact, uh, when you go to Orlando in Florida, half of the roller coasters are just visual roller coasters, right? So, so you don't, you know, move. You're just sitting in your chair and they rattle it a little bit, but, uh, you know, everything else is done visually and the illusion is perfect. You're scared to death, you know. And um, <clears throat> so it really works and my kids find it more frightening, you know, than the real roller coaster, in fact. <laughs> anyway, so um, the, the way that you know this kind of visual input can be described most precisely is by a vector field which is called the optic flow and here is an example for a pure translation if you're heading towards this point then what you see is that the points that are close to the your heading point move at a low velocity and the points that are far away from this heading point like to your sides then move at a large velocity. And this is something that you all know when you drive with your car down an alley, then you know, the trees you know, uh, further down the road move slowly in your visual field and the trees that you pass by you know, go like this. Right? So you have for each kind of your ego motion, you have a typical optic flow going along with that. And you can use this optic flow, and you're doing that all the time without being aware of that, to control your locomotion, right? So this is a typical optic flow for a translation, if you just move forward, um, and the optic flow for a rotation would look completely different. I'm going into the details of that a little bit later. Now, how come that when you've been watching this movie, you know, you've uh, experienced that vivid impression of self-motion. This is because we are, have area MST in our brains where neurons sit that respond to these large field motion stimuli called optic flow that go along with the typical kind of ego motion. And that is an fMRI study um, that was published three years ago. But uh, the first recordings, as far as I know, were done here by Bob Woods. Um, in the 90s, where they probed uh, the different uh, optic flows to drive uh, one of these neurons in the macaque brain. 
And as you can see, that sort of a homogeneous uh, motion across the large uh, visual field uh, or receptive field of these cells did not elicit much of a response. But as soon as they presented expansion flow fields, the way that, that occur when the uh, animal is tran uh, translating, then with the given pole of expansion, you got a very, very strong response. So these neurons were excited by optic flow stimuli with a pole of expansion in the ventral part of the visual field to the left, right? When you, then this pole of expansion is to the right, there was not much of a response. So these neurons become activated when you watch this movie and when you yourself move around in space. And now we go to the fly. The fly has a related brain center, like the MST of the fly. It's called the lobular plate. And uh, here we find neurons particularly sensitive to optic flow stimuli. And um, this photograph has been done by my long-year collaborator, Jürgen Haag, um, who dissected this blowfly, which is looking into the wall, and he cut a hole in the cuticle on the backside of the fly's head and stick the electrode into two different neurons, filled them with the red and the green fluorescent dye, and this is how these neurons look like. And the <clears throat> amazing thing is that in the fly visual system, I told you it's a tractable organism. Uh, there are only 50 of these neurons in each hemisphere, right? And these two cells here uh, belong to the group of VS cells, vertical sensitive cells. And I'm going to show you how the receptive fields of these cells look like in the blowfly. First, I want to show you, you know, where in the brain of the fly they uh, are located. And that is a schematic of the optic, of the visual system of the fly. And in red, you see the retina with the facet structure that house the photoreceptors. And it's followed by, you know, four layers of neuropil called the lamina, the medulla, the lobula, and the lobular plate. And each of these layers is strictly retinotopic. That means that the neighborhood relationship that you find in the eye of the fly are pertained when you go through these different layers of neuropil so that when you excite neighboring photoreceptors here, you will then also lead to an excitation of neurons in neighboring columns in the lamina, in the medulla, and in the lobular plate as well. And we've been showing that retinotopic structure of the lobular plate by doing calcium imaging, for example, from individual cells and then presenting a visual stimulus in the dorsal part of the visual field that then led to a calcium influx in this area. And when you positioned the stimulus in the ventral part of the visual field, you saw the calcium influx there. So we did physiology to demonstrate the retinotopic input organization into this lobular plate. But I said I want to show to you how the receptive fields of these cells look like. And uh, for that, we're going to concentrate on this subpopulation of the lobular plate tangential cells called VS cells. There are 10 of them in the blowfly and six of them in Drosophila in each lobular plate. And these experiments have been done by my student, Adrian Vetz. And <clears throat> now, uh, he determined the receptive fields of all of them, and I just want to show you three examples and show you the striking structure of these receptive fields. So this is the receptive field as you measure that for a large field motion-sensitive neuron. And again, you present the receptive field as a vector field, and at each location in visual space, which is you know, here in spherical coordinates with the azimuth to the right and the elevation on the y-axis, you measure the local preferred direction, which is then indicated by the uh, direction of the arrow, and the local sensitivity, which is then encoded by the length of that vector there. So what you see is that this neuron is largely downward sensitive in the lateral part of the, recept of the visual field, but it has an interesting curl in it. And this interesting curl looks as if it is a rotational vector field around this point here. 
And this point is zero, zero, meaning it's straight in front of the fly. Right? Now, uh, the interesting finding that was done by a colleague of mine, Holger Krapp and Roland Hengstenberg, about 12 years ago, is that um, such a neuron would be maximally stimulated by an optic flow that matches exactly this receptive field. Right? So you can calculate what kind of motion of the fly would lead to that kind of optic flow that then stimulates the VS5 still maximally. And as I said, you can imagine it would be a counter rotation, uh, counterclockwise rotation around this point, which then would be, if you look here at the fly, uh, a counterclockwise rotation around the longitudinal body axis of the fly. Right? So now let's look at a different cell, in this case the VS7 cell. Again, you see this rotational optic flow structure, but in this case, the center of rotation is shifted to the right. And so it's at about 30 or 40 degrees azimuth, which means that this cell would be activated most strongly by an optic flow that occurs when the fly rotates counterclockwise around this axis. It's an oblique axis, right? And, you know, as a last example, recording from VS9 cell, again, you have that rotational flow field which occurs during rotation of the fly around that body axis in the counterclockwise uh, direction, which is the transverse body axis. And so that would uh, then uh, occur when the fly does a pitch movement, right? <clears throat> so what we are dealing with basically is a set of neurons that represented matched filters for various types of ego motion. And this is why we think that these neurons are an uh, important part of the visual control system during insect flight. <clears throat> now, we spent many years to explain how these elaborate receptive fields come about, and we figured out the various connections between the different neurons, and then did computer simulations to reconstitute uh, these receptive fields and basically confirmed uh, that the inherent connectivity between the different neurons is sufficient to explain these uh, receptive field structures. But uh, today I decided to talk about a much more basic property of these neurons and that is direction selectivity per se. This shows to you a recording that a very talented uh, grad student in the lab, Max Jösch, has done. And he developed uh, the preparation that allowed us now to record from those tangential cells, not in the big flies, but in the small uh, genetically tractable animal Drosophila. And of course, that took good hands in some patients, but he was very successful. And this is the fly mounted underneath this microscope and uh, he's been using a patch pipet uh, to suck onto the soma of these tangential cells. And if you present upward or downward motion, then you get a hyperpolarization for upward motion. Uh, that is called the, the null direction of the cell. And this is a depolarization in response to downward motion that is called the preferred direction of this cell. So direction selectivity is this phenomenon that the cell responds differently to motion in opposite directions, right? So why is that so interesting, you know? And why is that such a basic feature? And why is that such a good example for neural computation? Well, the reason is that a single photoreceptor is non-direction selective, right? If you were to record from a photoreceptor and you move a bar to the right and to the left again, you would see the same response both times, right? If you move your electrode just four synapses downstream from the photoreceptor in the retina uh, into the lobular plate and you record from one of these lobular plate tangential cells, then you see a direction selective response, right? It's depolarizing in the preferred direction and to the null direction stimulus, it's hyperpolarizing. So somehow, between here and there, 
some computation occurs that leads you from a non-directional response to a direction-selective response. So what is this mechanism? Well, this mechanism has been modeled and precisely described already 50 years ago by Werner Reichardt, who was a Max Planck director at the Max Planck Institute of Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen. And his famous model is called after him the Reichardt detector. And such a Reichardt detector has a very simple structure. And it consists of two uh, mirror symmetrical subunits which share the same two input lines. So these half circles symbolize like photoreceptors. And what you do is uh, you take the signal from one photoreceptor, you pass it through a low pass filter, which then leads to a certain delay. And then you multiply this signal with the instantaneous signal from the neighboring photoreceptor. And you do that in a mirror symmetrical way in the other subunit. And then you subtract those two signals and you get a perfectly direction selective signal. Right? And to show you how such you know, an models sort of would respond to a moving object, I have a little animation. And um, so here you see an array of photoreceptors that might you know, symbolize you know, the retina of the fly. And each of these photoreceptors is followed by a delay line, by this low pass filter, and then has four multipliers, which hook up to the instantaneous signal uh, received from the neighboring uh, photoreceptors. And that's done for uh, motion in the x as well in the y direction. So this is why you need four of these multipliers. And uh, when I start the movie, I might need it a little bit dark. Then you see, you know, it's moving to the left. This one was excited. Now the excitation is delayed here and now coincides with the instantaneous signal from this one leading to a large output signal here. Now both are active. That then leads to an output signal here. Now this one is delayed. This one is active and you get a signal here. And this is how this is thought to operate. Now, <clears throat> this model actually, as sort of simple as it looks like, uh, has many interesting properties. And many of these properties are sort of counterintuitive. First of all, such an array of a uh, Riker detector does not act like a speedometer, you know, sort of uh, being linearly related to image velocity. Rather, it has a velocity optimum, and if you go below the, beyond that optimum, the response falls off again. And through this correlation type of interaction with the multipliers in there, it's also sensitive to the contrast of the moving object, which is again something strange. But if you do behavioral experiments in humans or in insects, you find there is sort of a, a contrast dependence of the perceived speed and there is indeed an optimum velocity and all that stuff. So this model has been tested phenomenologically a lot. And just as one example, how well it describes what's going on in the fly, I wanted to show you this you know, experiment where we've been using uh, a grating that we sort of jittered back and forth. So this is the velocity by which this grating is moving in the preferred and in the null direction of a particular cell that is called H1, we've been recording from. And so this is basically a white noise Gaussian profile, uh, <clears throat> low pass filtered a little bit. And these experiments and simulations were done by another student, Hubert Eichner, in the lab. Now this is what you get as the firing rate of the H1 neuron, which is another lobular plate cell. And you can see that whenever the object moves, in the, when the grating moves in the uh, preferred direction, you get these strong excitations and you get it sort of clipped off for motion in the null direction because this is a spiking neuron that cannot go beyond, uh, you know, below zero here. But it nicely reflects the velocity profile uh, in the preferred direction of the cell, so the positive half of this wave. And now look at a simulation that Hubert did where he was using an array of such Riker detectors that then feed 
into a leaky integrated fire model just to get some spikes out of the simulations because from these guys you only get an analog signal. You know, this is what the simulation looks like and it really faithfully copies, you know, what H1 does. So it is really a very good description of, <coughs> of uh, this uh, uh, real process that is going on in the fly. But the question is, you know, here in the simulation, we, you know, we sort of, this is thought to represent the tangential cell uh, of the lobular plate, and this is somehow the transformation of the input signals from the retina onto the dendrite of that cell. But, you know, what are these neurons there? So for that, I just want to show you what's presynaptic, you know, to these tangential cells, what is between the retina and the dendrites of these lobular plate cells. And um, so let's look at that. If we cut through and now take a look at the horizontal section through the optic lobes, then you see again the facet structure and the columnar structure of the visual system of the fly. But you see that there are many different cell types uh, in these neuropils. Like here, you see the endings of the photoreceptors in the lamina. Then you see lamina neurons that take this signal and transport it to the medulla in particular layers. Then you see that there are intrinsic medulla neurons that link different layers within the medulla. And then there are feedback neurons from the medulla into the lamina. And then there are neurons like the T4 cells that take the signal from the medulla and bring it onto the dendrites of the lobular plate tangential cells. These are sort of one type of cells, the T4 cells, and these are the T5 cells that link the lobular to the lobular plate. Now here, I just drew one representative of each type of neurons that we have. And I only drew it once. I mean, you have to imagine that you know, per column, you know, all these different cells occur. But if you look at all the different cell types that there are in the visual system of the fly, you get this picture, right? And keep in mind, um, I only drew every cell here once. Actually, it wasn't me. It was Fischbach and Dietrich, uh, you know, published in 89. So the complexity is really stunning. There are about a total of about 100 cell types you know, that live in these columns uh, in the different uh, optic neuropils of the fly. And each one of them lives once uh, per column. And the question is, how then does that relate to this computational structure, right? So somehow we, <clears throat> you know, have this Reichert detector as a black box and we sort of made sure that with respect to the input-output relationship, you know, this structure really confirms, is confirmed, and so somehow these computations have to be implemented in this neuropil here, but we don't know what neurons, and we don't know what is the biophysics of the computation that is postulated here. So, at least to me, this became the holy grail of fly motion vision, and we've been hunting it now for many years, but as I said, we made some recent progress, and that's what I want to talk about today. And in particular, we're interested to learn what neurons constitute uh, the Reichardt detector and what is the biophysics of the neural computation, the question that drove me, uh, you know, right from the beginning of my research. And uh, I just want to briefly introduce, you know, two sort of key techniques that enabled us to dissect the system and, uh, in Drosophila. And the first one is a technique that allows you to target specific cells and make sure that what you want to express genetically is in the neurons that, you know, in the right neurons. And this system is the GAL4 UAS system where you get sort of uh, the expression of GAL4 under a genomic enhancer. This is what is brought in by dad, and then you cross it with mom, and mom brings in the effector gene. So this determines 
in which neurons it is expressed, and this says what is being expressed. And what is being expressed in our case was a specific blocker to block synaptic transmission, a gene called Shibiri, which encodes dynamine, and dynamine is a, a GTPase which is uh, used for vesicle recycling, and uh, Shibiri is a dominant negative mutation, so even in a wild-type background, if you bring in the transgene of a mutated Shibiri, this will block synaptic transmission um, uh, effectively. And one more thing, a nice thing about Shibiri is that uh, there are many, many temperature-sensitive alleles of Shibiri, so when you leave the fly at room temperature, synaptic transmission is fine, you see no block at all, and uh, when you raise the temperature, uh, in our case for an hour at 37 degrees, then you have a block of synaptic transmission for at least three or four hours. So you can use flies of the same genotype as control animals, you just don't heat them up for one hour as and, uh, experimental flies. Right? So any sort of genetic background uh, problems uh, go away. So we started with you know, from the periphery and asked what laminar neurons provide the input to the Riker detector. And there are five different laminar neurons called L1 to L5, which sit either directly or indirectly after the photoreceptors are 1 to 6. And they terminate in different layers of the medulla. And this is the neuropil where we assume that our magical Riker detector lives. And that Riker detector is then synapsing onto the tangential cells in the lobular plate. And so the technique that we've been using was to use host cell patch recording from the tangential cells and then block specific laminar neurons and ask under which conditions do we see a reduced or impaired motion response, right? So <clears throat> we've been concentrating on two prominent laminar neurons, L1 and L2, and I just want to show you uh, an electron microscopy picture that was taken by Christoph Kapfer in the lab that shows the different cartridges like the facets of the eye repeated at the level of the lamina. And this is where the photoreceptors are one to six are ending. And you see large profiles in the center of each of these uh, cartridges. And if you zoom in, you realize these two profiles, one of them is L1, the other one is L2. And these are the surrounding terminals of the photoreceptors are one to six, right? And now, you need uh, driver lines for that, and um, I just want to show it to you that L1 has endings in two distinct layers of the medulla, and L2 has an, a single ending in layer two of the medulla. And uh, then um, we got interesting and very good driver lines from our colleague Chihon Lee here at NIH. Um, and we found another driver line for L2 uh, from someone else. And uh, <clears throat> Shamprasad Raghu did all these confocal image stacks to confirm that this line is really having a strong expression in L1. You see layer one and layer five labeled here, which is indicative for L1 cells. And this driver line here is for L2. So you only get labels here in the lamina, in the medulla layer two. So, what do the experiments look like? What you see here is the response in millivolt as obtained from these recordings from the tangential cells in response to a grading that moves up and down, so in the preferred and in the null direction of the cells, as a function of the contrast of the grading. And in black, you see the response of the control flies, which had the same genetic background, everything the same, um, but were not heated up. And what you see is a nice increase of the response to preferred direction uh, stimuli with increasing contrast, which then finally settles at some you know, uh, eight millivolts or so. We, when you move the grading in the null direction, you have an inhibition which also grows with contrast. If we block the synaptic output from laminar neurons L1 and L2, the response is gone. 
So remember, we did not affect the other cells, and that tells you right away that L1 and L2 must be major inputs to the motion detection system in the fly, right? But what about sort of the individual contribution of L1 and L2? For that, we used uh, a line that blocked L1, and you see that we got a strong impairment of the wild-type response, so L1 itself also must be, you know, a high contribution to the uh, input of the motion detection system. And here we use two different lines to block L2 output, and we again saw a significant reduction of the control response. So together that says that L1 and L2 both represent major input signals to the motion detection system. But it does not say, you know, with how they sort of uh, diversify, how they specialize. And uh, so we asked ourselves, you know, why is the photoreceptor signal split onto L1 and L2 if both provide the same kind of signal into the motion detection system? You know, maybe one 40%, the other one 60%, or 50-50, you know, it just sort of didn't talk to me, yeah? And so we went through a couple of different possibilities. And we said maybe L1 represents the local arm of this detector and the L2 represents the lateral arm. Well, in this case, block of either L1 or L2, you know, would lead to zero output, which was not the case. So we could discard that possibility. Then we thought maybe L1 feeds into the vertical system and L2 feeds into the horizontal system, right? So then we would have expected that, you know, L1 block flies are blind for vertical motion and L2 block flies are blind for horizontal motion. Didn't make sense. We checked that on VS cells, HS cells. Discard. Then we said maybe the two directions, you know, opposite directions are so fed differentially by L1 and L2. So maybe L1 feeds into the front to back, L2 into the back to front system. Also, forget it. Then we, you know, investigated the question whether maybe L1 feeds into sort of a low contrast motion vision system and L2 into a high contrast vision system. No, also not. So we've been sitting on this data for a while, thinking about it, and then we got inspiration from the father of neuroscience, Ramon Icajal. He pointed out in his work that actually the fly lamina looks different from the retina of the vertebrate, but due to two peculiarities that we have in the fly visual system. First of all, the soma is not in the processing chain of the neuron. It's you know, attached to the rest by a cell body fiber. And second, we have these particular chiasms in between. But you might be able to merge those two things by moving the fly soma into the processing way and then sort of flip the retina over so that it now has also chiasms. And just in very general terms point out that the lamina neurons that he saw should somehow correspond to bipolar cells of the vertebrate retina. And that sounded like a great idea because we knew, as you all know too, that we have two sorts of bipolar cells, you know, postsynaptic to our uh, cones. And these are the famous on and off bipolar cells that were discovered by Werbling and Dowling in 69. So here's this experiment that is published in the original paper where he then raises the luminance in an off bipolar and he's getting a depolarization. And if he does the same thing in an on bipolar, he's getting a depolarization. So that was an interesting idea. And we would have missed this a distinction completely because we've been using gratings and the grating is composed of a moving on and a moving off edge simultaneously. So any kind of differential contribution of L1 and L2 you know, cannot be seen using that kind of stimulus. And that was the time when we you know, came up with moving on and off edges. 
which then gave us the answer rapidly. And so again, these experiments were done by Max Josch, now moving on or off edges that selectively would stimulate these subsystems. And now we saw very specific and different effects when we blocked L1 or L2. So when we blocked L1, again using the same driver line, uh, then this is in black again the response of the control flies and in green the response of the blocked flies. When we blocked L1, the response to the moving on edge was completely gone. While it was still sort of significant uh, when uh, a moving off edge was applied. And the reverse was true when we blocked L2. Again, in black, you see the response of the uh, control flies to moving uh, on and off edges. And here, the response to the moving on edge was nicely retained, while the response to the moving off edge was strongly impaired. So now we see the differential contribution of L1 and L2 to the motion detection system, one providing the input to an on system and the other one to an off system. So these were the people contributing to this study here that led to the proposal that L1 and L2 feed into the motion detection system by providing positive contrast polarity, L1, and uh, negative contrast polarity, the off system, by L2. That was very satisfying. But now, you know, it's sort of time to step back and ask, what have we learned? You know, I told you that we want to hunt down the Reichert detector and see the neural implementation of it. And so this was the black box. And using Drosophila genetics in combination with electrophysiology, we wanted to open the black box. We did that. So what came out? Basically, you know, two new black boxes. Now, you know, one Riker detector for the on pathway and another one for the off pathway. So the work has doubled, right? <clears throat> of course, <laughs> you know, that's not really what I believe. And I want to you know, tell you the, the positive news. Uh, first of all, you know, I ask you that we have two, I told you we have two questions. First, what neurons? And second, what biophysics? Uh, what neurons? Now, knowing that L1 and L2 feeds into these you know, two parallel motion pathways, you can look at the anatomy and ask, what are the neurons postsynaptic to these cells? And then track those neurons as candidate neurons for the participation in the local motion detector. And there has been a lot of work being done in the past. And in fact, already in the 90s, it was proposed that L1 contacts a med medulla intrinsic neuron, MI1, which then contacts the dendrites of the T4 cells that then synapse onto the dendrites of the tangential cells. So that was the L1 pathway. The L2 pathway consists, you know, by contacts from L1 onto a transmedullar neuron 1, which then contacts the T5 cells, which then in turn uh, contact the uh, lobular plate tangential cells. And, you know, at that time, they proposed these pathways and had no idea about the functional, you know, relevance of the two pathways. And the relation to any kind of Riker detector was not obvious by that. But now we know that L1 feeds into the on pathway and L2 into the off pathway. So we would predict that the T4 cells actually represent locomotion sensors for on motion, for moving on edges only. Whereas the, T, uh, the T5 cells that sh should then uh, respond specifically to moving off edges. And I will at the end show to you how we are going to test that, uh, hopefully this year. So now, through work you know, done in Genelia Farm, you know, the people now study the, the connectivity between these cells at the EM, and they confirm this picture that was already proposed in the 90s very nicely. And now we know that here L1 makes exactly 30 synapses onto MI1 in layer one and another 28 synapses in the EM uh, in layer five, etc. 
So this is rock stable and rock solid. And uh, we can now use this anatomy, this information, and then pick uh, those candidate neurons and then you sort of interfere with that the same way we interfered with L1 and L2 to figure out uh, the you know, further elements of the motion detector. But <clears throat> what about the biophysics of neural computation? What did our result you know, tell us about the biophysics of the multiplication? Well, with the multiplication, there was always this problem that there is the sign rule of multiplication telling you that um, if you have two inputs, A and B, sort of synapsing onto a postsynaptic neuron, then if this postsynaptic neuron multiplies A and B, and if A can go positive and negative, and B as well, then you know, the outcoming voltage should be positive uh, for when both A and B are positive, but somehow strangely, it should also be positive when both go negative. Right? And they should go negative when they have mixed input signs. So somehow, you know, I cannot imagine any sort of ion channel arrangement in the dendrite of a neuron that does that. And uh, that is just, you know, shown further on here where you have the two input signals when they raise the input frequency. Here you get much more out of them, but, you know, who has seen, seen that? That if they both cease to fire, then the output neuron again sort of goes crazy. So I think that splitting the input signal into separate channels, halfway rectifying it, and treating the positive and the negative part of such a signal in separate channels solves this problem. Because you can here, you know, transport the upper part of the signal in L1 and the lower part in L2 and represent them in the on and in the off pathway. So you're dealing with positive signals only, right? And that solves this problem of the biophysics of multiplication at least, you know, to some extent, so that you don't have to worry about how the implementation of the sign rule. All you need then is some kind of supralinearity to take care of the multiplication. If you split the signals up and treat positive and negative input signals in separate channels. And um, so we came up with sort of a new model uh, to account for local motion detection, which we call the two-quadrant detector, which is actually composed by two Reichert detectors, you know, exact same structure, one dealing exclusively with positive signals, on signals, the other one with off signals. So we have an on motion detector and an off motion detector, and you might wonder how does that relate to the original model. And again, Hubert Eichner did some simulation here, you know, this is the velocity signal as a function of time. In blue, you see or you don't see the response of the Riker detector. And in red, you see the two-quadrant detector overlaid, and it's identical to the original Riker detector. So it does extremely well. Now, with this model, we could also then simulate uh, the blocking experiments of L1 and L2 that I showed to you before. And so, uh, this would be the two-quadrant detector, uh, sort of with no blocking, sort of our uh, wild-type control detector. Uh, that is the response to the grating in the null and in the preferred direction. If you now use a moving on edge, you get a nice you know, null and preferred direction response. You get the same thing for a moving off edge. And now you can simulate an L1 block and you get a reduction in the response to the grating, but the response to the moving on edge is completely gone, while the response to the moving off edge is unaffected. Conversely, if you block L2, again, you see a reduction in the response to the moving grating, but here you have an intact response to the moving on edge and an abolished response to the moving off edge. So this is now sort of the working model, and as I told you, we speculate 
that these cells here, sort of the output cells, should be the T4 cells, and these cells should be represented by the T5 cells in the fly visual system. So this is like an outlook, what we're going to do right now. We got uh, two driver lines for T4 and T5 cells uh, from Alyosha Nern and Gerald Rubin at Janelia Farm. And this is a driver line that highlights the T5 cells. This is the dendrite, this is the soma fiber, this is the soma, that's the lobular plate. And this line nicely highlights the T5 cells and this line uh, partly highlights the T4 cells and using these and similar driver lines we are now going to use genetically encoded indicators to record from these local columnar cells and confirm or not and test whether T4 indeed is responsive selectively for on motion and a T5 for off motion and then also repeat the blocking experiments the same way that we did it with the lamina neurons. So this is how far we got in the surge uh, of the holy grail of fly motion vision. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, questions, uh, please use the microphones. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, it looked like when you showed the data for your L1 and L2 blocking experiments that you saw some, uh, some redu reduction uh, in the effect of, uh, yeah. of the on motion and the off motion. Yeah. Uh, so right. what, what were your, what's your thought about that? <clears throat> Yeah, so it was not 100% versus 0% or so. Right. Um, you know, knowing that none of these driver lines is 100% clean, right, you are happy with that kind of specificity, I would say. We, we don't know. I mean, it could have two reasons. I mean, one would be sort of the uh, non-specificity or lack of 100% specificity of the driver line. An alternative explanation would be some crosstalks between the two systems. And um, I think that uh, we are going to see that then finally uh, when recording from T4 and T5 cells. So then we know, I mean, whether our sort of uh, separation, strict separation into two parallel uh, pathways is that strict or not. We, we still don't know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for a fabulous talk. Uh, my question actually was about gap junction coupling between L1 and L2. Yeah. So since you showed very nicely in your paper there was this gap junction coupling, uh, I was wondering how you would explain the specialization between <laughs> on and off when they're yeah. actually coupled. Right. Sure. Um, he relates to some data that uh, are in this paper uh, that I did not present uh, in order not to confuse <laughs> you too much, that are no aficionados of the fly visual system. In fact, we found that L1 and L2 cells are gap junction coupled. So the question is, how come that those cells provide specific input into sort of two different pathways when they are, you know, coupled electrically, right? And the answer is that First of all, this coupling occurs in the dendrite of the cells where they receive identical input from the photoreceptors anyway, right? And uh, the question is then, you know, at what level does this differentiation or specificity for on and off occur? For L2, we precisely know because we did calcium imaging of the terminals uh, in the medulla and there, Basically, when the cell hyperpolarizes, uh, this is clipped off by a voltage-activated calcium channel, and you only are left with the off response. So for L2, we know that the signal leaving the synapse in the medulla is already off-selective. For L1, we don't know yet. But at this meeting where I just came from, Tom Clendinen from Stanford reported calcium imaging from L1, and uh, that sort of is, is very interestingly looking because the 
uh, calcium signal in the two layers have opposite polarity. And uh, I mean, neither he nor I nor anyone else can explain that. But if you record from the postsynaptic cell, uh, this MI1 cell, uh, this one is already on specific. So through some, you know, synaptic mechanism, which has a net inhibitory effect from L1 onto MI1, you turn this hyperpolarization of the uh, lamina cell into a depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron, and that is then on specific. So at MI1, you already see that in the postsynaptic cells of L1 and L2. So it's done partly within the axon terminals of the cells and at the synapse, so to say. And then in the postsynaptic cells, you see the full specificity of the two pathways. And it's not impaired by the gap junctional coupling in the dendrite. But, but really getting into biophysics of that is, is very interesting. I agree. Thank you. I also enjoyed your talk very much. You mentioned at one point optimization. I've forgotten exactly in what context, but I'm wondering, is, is the uh, Riker detector optimized for particular velocities of motion, uh, or is there an optimization that yeah. can be and yeah. is built in? I'm, uh, I said there is an optimal velocity. I did not mean that this is optimized sort of in an evolutionary term or uh, energy constraint or whatever. Um, but the interesting thing is that if you plot uh, the response of the Riker detector as a function of uh, image velocity, then unlike a speedometer, you go to an optimum, and if you go beyond that, it goes down again, which is something that people said sort of like a defect of the detector. But then you do the behavioral measurements in the flies, see the same thing. If you do the recordings from these neurons, you see the same thing. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good description of what's going on. Whether it makes sense in sort of engineering terms, I don't know. Okay, so if I may uh, ask a question. Um, so maybe coming off on a non-believer, okay, so a skeptic um, view. You know, when you look at the, you know, later this year, when you look at this, uh, you know, uh, the T4 and T5 neurons, what would you predict? Let's say, what kind of data will convince you that's really not right car detector? The main problem, I think, that in the field is the right car detector is a conceptual model. It's actually quite elusive in terms of the actual uh, mm -hmm. um, implementations. Yeah. But what yeah. kind of uh, data would, would actually make you believe that it's not a Riker detector? It's not a Riker detector. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Can't be. Um, no. <laughs> you see, we did all these measurements in the postsynaptic cells, which are the tangential cells. So we made sure that the contrast dependence fits, that the velocity dependence fits. So it's got to be there, so to say. It's, uh, it does not say, you know, how precisely it's done in neural terms, but the overall input-output behavior has already been tested, and it confirms to this model, so to say. Uh, it's, of course, an open question what kind of dendritic nonlinearity you have there and how well that can be de described by a multiplication or just a supralinearity or maybe a threshold uh, nonlinearity and, and stuff like that. So I'm I, w I would say I'm absolutely open-minded uh, when it goes about the implementation, but sort of overall, it, it has to work like this model because we tested, you know, from both ends, so to say, that it confirms to that. And, and this is actually what I like about it because I, I know precisely what I have to explain. Whatever I find, when I put it together, so to say, I have done these measurements. I know that at the output it has to behave like that. <laughs> so. Okay, I know it's kind of a nasty question, um, but <laughs> it's <answered> perfectly well. <laughs> uh, so if there's no more questions, let's uh, uh, please join me to uh, thanks uh, Dr. Boss.